It's hard to find anyone my age who didn't love the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles back in the day. Hell, it's tough to find anyone nowadays that doesn't at least know about them. But back when I was a kid, the kids who loved those heroes in a half shell, Turtle Power, didn't just love them half-heartedly. It was a full-on obsession. Halloweens were inundated with green four-year-olds brandishing lawsuit-inducing nunchucks. Christmases were flush with action figures, sticker sets, and if you were lucky, that one tank that shoots those pizza discs. And when I was four years old, I was no different. I too desperately craved any and all TMNT paraphernalia, and that included the Turtles' many video game adventures. But Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Turtles in Time was special for me. It was my absolute favorite TMNT game, and for good reason. But it's been quite a while since I completed that game, which means I've got to see if Turtles in Time has stood the test of time. Hey everyone, and welcome back to a brand new episode of The Completionist New Game Plus, a show in which I am recompleting 120 episodes of the original Completionist lineup. Now, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 4 Turtles in Time is one of my important childhood games. I grew up playing this game in a way where I would play it non-stop just because I loved the turtles. However, here on the channel, this is the first time I'm actually talking about it because it originally appeared as an episode of The Mediocrist, which was a parody of The Completionist. So the real question is, does this game still hold up with all the good and nostalgic memories I have of it from when I was a kid? Let's find out. Yes. actually happened. I was four years old and my dad was on a business trip in Chicago while some contractors were doing construction on our house. I was in the wrong place at the wrong time and I tripped on a cable and fell down a flight of stairs. And my fragile four-year-old head hit every single stair on the way down, knocking me out and putting me into a coma for a few days. Since there weren't cell phones back then, my dad didn't know at all that his family had gone to the hospital. But a day or so later, my dad was finally able to get a hold of us and after all the doctors tried everything they could. My dad demanded to speak to me over the phone, and the rest is history. So it kind of makes sense why Turtles in Time is so special to me. The last time we featured it here on the show, it was more of a goofy joke than a real episode. And honestly, thinking about it now, I think I made it a joke because I wasn't comfortable telling this honest and emotional story. But now, thanks to New Game Plus, I get a shot at sharing my actual thoughts about a game I hold very close to my heart. Don't worry, I'll do my best to remain unbiased to my opinions. Even though this game helped perform a medical miracle, it was a miracle, you guys! I realize that my life consists of locking myself away and playing video games until my brain goes totally videodrome. Don't keep me waiting. Please. But I still like people. Well, most people, Steve. And as a kid, arcades were a great place to meet fellow game enthusiasts. They were like little sports bars for the unrunable people. Oh god, I'm so bad at sports that I had to go look up the word unathletic. Back then, I wanted to hang out with, and I'm using the most intense air quotes that I possibly can, cool kids. But of course, if a game did have a two-player option, it was usually competitive. And direct competition with someone doesn't always breed camaraderie. He's got to be sad. You got to be salty after that. He, he, he had, had it won the previous round. Whoa, he's he's stick. Whoa. Stick. He is that salty. 
Yeah, if there's anything that scares me more than first impressions, it's confrontation. Go beta males. Luckily, along came beat em ups. With games like Double Dragon, you could walk up next to anyone and immediately slug, chop, and shank your way into their heart. It wasn't just about attaining a high score with someone there. It was about helping them reach the ending on fewer quarters than if they played the game alone. Even if you didn't become best buddies with your arcade partner, you were at least a small financial aid. Cause no one likes when friends cost you money, right Brett? It was five bucks for a cab ride to the hospital. See, this is why I didn't drive you myself. So much whining. Bradley shift me with a stylus. 1988 to 1993 could be considered the golden age of the side-scrolling beat-em-up genre, and because of the genre's flexibility, they became the darling of licensed properties. The Simpsons, The Punisher, X-Men, and Alien vs. Predator were all glorious, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Turtles in Time, both lived up to that standard and managed to dodge the bullet by making sure it was abbreviated as TMNT, Turtles in Time, rather than, well, the game was an arcade success and was eventually ported to home consoles, but Turtles in Time was actually the second Turtles game to end up making it from a cabinet to console. The first arcade Turtles title became the second NES game, and the second arcade game became the fourth. The third stayed the third, but the fourth was the first on SNES. Follow? No? Radical. Just like many games before it, the developers could have gutted out huge amounts of gameplay from the Turtles in Time port, <clears throat> Final Fight, or change it to the point of becoming unidentifiable, Dragon Slayer! <clears throat> but the terrible arcade port was yet another bullet that flew right towards Turtles in Time. But then Splinter put his hand in the air and was like, no. The SNES was more than capable of emulating the critical elements of the Turtles, helping to cement the Ninja Turtles as not only my favorite TV show from my childhood, but also my favorite games, favorite movies, favorite toys, favorite theme song. Was there any medium those boys didn't conquer? I even love the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Radio Hour. Konami did everything they could to emulate the arcade experience on SNES technology. Of course, at the time, consoles paled in comparison to the power of a specially made arcade cabinet, so adjustments had to be made. But as Konami taketh away, so Konami giveth. Or at least they used to. Now they mostly taketh. What you say? Back when they were a bit more magnanimous, they made up for their discrepancies between the arcade and console versions by adding remastered music to the SNES chip as well as an extra level. Not just any level, but one that included one of the most iconic bosses to come from the game. The story starts like any story should, with a giant Krang stealing the Statue of Liberty. And what happens when a landmark is yoinked by Krang? Obviously, a bunch of turtles get mad. And what is the most obvious way to get rid of turtles? You jump into a computer and you send them to the age of the dinosaurs, your classic hero's journey. Ridiculous? Yes. Appropriate to the show? Oh, absolutely. No need to dissect why the turtles are able to jump time periods after each level, or how Shredder finds the budget to send all of his foot soldiers to 1885. It's simply a vehicle to give the heroes new and interesting sights and sounds. Each level's music is as fantastic as the day you first played it at Chuck. Chuck E. Cheese. I have a real soft spot for the first level's music. I could hear just those first five notes. That first 
first tune takes the original TV show theme and mixes it into something fresh. Konami used the same music team for pretty much all of their Turtle games, and I think this was their magnum opus. The soundtrack utilizes the sound chip of the SNES really well, pulling off pretty full guitar and drum sets. Now, I know the SNES wasn't as proficient at vocal tracks as arcade cabinets were, but dear lord, I wish the game still opened with pizza power. Growing up in a glass bowl with camellia slizzards and tadpoles It hardly enters your mind that there's something better than this Oof! Maybe I spoke too soon. I didn't know Raphael was a triple threat, singing, dancing, and making me cringe to the point of constipation. Vocals aside, everything else sounds great. The punching and explosions are classic 16-bit, and that's good because everything you punch explodes in the game. Foot soldiers, barrels, everything. See? Those rocks just exploded. Every boss whirs like a nuclear fidget spinner, and then... And then there's that particular sound when you hit a boss that really warms my heart. I don't know why, but I just love that sound. Nothing sounds like it. I racked my brain for any comparison and I couldn't find one. I even spent too much time trying to spell it out for the script. Thromp, twomp, bwomp. In fact, from now on, I'm replacing all of my bleeps in this episode with that sound. Yeah! The palette of Turtles in Time is potent. Everything pops. The colors are bold and lively while giving off an inviting warmth contrasted against many other beat-em-ups that took place mostly on gray city streets or in dull, dim rooms. TMNT sticks very close to the source material. It has every visual aspect of the cartoon. The foot soldiers rock their vibrant 80s glory, and like the troll dolls of the era, they come in all sorts of colors. The other sprites are equally crystal Pepsi-ified, whatever that means. Aside from the foot soldiers, though, there are really only about six other basic enemies. Two types of droids, a raptor, thing, a pterodactyl type thing, those goddamn rock men, and is is that a f***ing xenomorph from Alien? Now that would have made a kick-ass crossover movie. Alien vs. TMNT? Just imagine a scene where Jordan's chest bursts open and Michelangelo starts screaming, GAME OVER MAN! GAME OVER! But what makes up for the basic enemies are the bosses. They are modeled very true to the show and movies. You've got to appreciate Leatherhead dress as a cowboy, plus Bebop and Rocksteady, who were added to the console port, by the way, making their best effort to get into the movie Hook. Turtles in Time follows all the successful gaming tropes established from 1987 up until its release. Each of the turtles have their advantages and disadvantages. Mike has power, Raph is fast, Don has reach, and Leo is the balance between them all. For better or for worse, the differences are limited enough that you can still pick your favorite turtle with no worry as to which one is the most strategically viable. Each of the guys have the classic genre moves the standard combo, a dash attack, a special attack, two types of jump attack, and finally throws. Ah, those two button days. We may be spoiled now by games like Castle Crashers or Scott Pilgrim with leagues of combos and abilities, but when Turtles in Time was in arcades, it needed to make their moves easy to learn so you would stick around and drop more Washingtons. Except for maybe the throws. Now, they are easily my favorite move in the game, but they can be a little touchy. It takes a bit to find the delicate balance between a Looney Tunes style slam or chucking a foot soldier into the screen. But once I figured them out, oh my goodness, so satisfying. Like plugging in a USB cable the correct way first try. That kind of satisfying. The combat is varied enough to avoid becoming repetitive, but that's due to the diverse combat situation and shorter length of the game. There are 10 levels here, and without any resets or begging dad for more quarters, Turtles in Time can easily be beaten in a little over an hour, especially if done with a friend. It takes a lot of talented designers to make the player feel like they've gone through an epic journey in such a short amount of time. And Konami definitely rose to the challenge. Each level is a sort of tiny episode of the cartoon set in a different location or time period. Big Apple, 3 a.m. I love hearing that. I know, I know, it sounds like your vice principal is saying it over the school PA system. Big Apple, 3 a.m.
I think I love it because it's a great contrast for the wild visuals and sounds the game is about to throw at you. Especially at the time, Konami could have gotten away with point A scrolling to point B, then warp to point C, and fight and scroll your way to point D. But thankfully, they broke up the basic pan and punch system with levels like Sewer Surfing with the Killer Pizzas and Neon Knight Riders, where you ride on hover Roombas around what seems to be Mute City from F-Zero. Running into the bosses you know and love from the series is a delight too. You get a chance to make all of your favorites like Krang and Slash explode. Each fight is an excellent punctuation to every level, especially the end of the first visit to the Technodrome where you fight Shredder in a giant mech and have to throw foot soldiers at his face until he also explodes. Konami must have wanted to give a little more weight to the SNES port since there's also a one-on-one -on -one fighting mode and time trial mode. I mean, the extra modes are pretty bare bones, but their addition is way more than the arcade ports at the time had, so I think that's worth appreciating here. I didn't get to do a full-fledged review the first time around for TMNT 4, so it's a joy to reaffirm myself that it's just as visually stunning as when I played it when I was 4. The music is as catchy as it was when I was 10, the gameplay is as simple and fulfilling as when I was 18, and it's still brilliant now at the age of 24. 24. Hey, 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 do not make me show you that creepy live turtle show again. Yeah, yeah, not, yeah. Oh, man, that's a good looking young YouTuber. Happy 24. Yeah. Happy 24. Technically, Turtles in Time does have a hard mode, and beating that mode will get you a pretty sentimental reward, a portrait of the whole gang over the Super Nintendo version of the Pizza Power song. I mean, that's all, but come on, it's the Pizza Power song! Looking for waves that can't be found Too bad The serpent subterranean hammer too bad Yikes, I both love and hate that whole thing. I miss it, yet I'm disgusted. I think I just came up with a whole new word. Grossalgia. Grossalgia. When you remember loving something from your youth, but upon revisiting it, it makes you very, very uncomfortable. Grossalgia. As far as cheats and Easter eggs go, there is a secret song you can get access in the sound test. But that's it, which is fine with me. If I'm playing a bad game, I don't care if it gives me 800 alternate costumes or a debug menu that turns every enemy into a frog with googly eyes. It's still a bad game. But if I relive some of the happiest gaming moments of my childhood, and feel completely guilt-free because the game's as good as I remember it being? Awesome! Even if there aren't many rewards for playing it, if I get to share that feeling with a friend, even better. This game makes me feel like a kid all over again, with its simple pick-up-and-play style, its catchy music, and wild visuals. Once again, the original version of this video wasn't about the huge imprint the game left in my life. But now, I get to express how Turtles in Time helped me through a scary time. And even now, when things get rough, I can wrap myself in it like a digital blanket and feel a little bit better. I don't want to get sappy here, but sometimes, it's not what you can unlock in the game, it's what the game unlocks in you. Aw, that's pretty sappy, Gerard. Come on. What? That was beautiful! Give me that five bucks back or you're f***ing done! Oh, so now you're the Tony Robbins of YouTube? Hey, f*** you! Hey, f*** you, man! Turtles in Time. Friendship and innocence. In my playthrough of TMNT Turtles in Time, there were two full campaign playthroughs, one on normal and one on hard mode, one hour and 54 minutes of total playtime, three time trials conquered, 36 lives lost, and one trip to Pizza Hut that I'm taking me in the office to after the big game. If you've ever loved Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, then you have to play Turtles in Time. If you love beat-em-ups, retro games, great soundtracks, great 16-bit art, play Turtles in Time. So grab a friend, grab some sodas, some cheesy puffs, maybe even a Pizza Hut pizza, get the SNES version of the game, do not even bother with the remaster, and talk and laugh and play like you used to when you were a kid. I can't honestly remember the last time I played a beat em up where I was smiling from ear to ear the entire time. In 2017, this game unfortunately is not available for purchase in the digital format. You have to go out to a flea market or a retro gaming convention to find this game. And unfortunately, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 4 Turtles in Time for the Super Nintendo is a kind of a pricey game. It goes anywhere from 60 bucks to 100 depending on the condition. And luckily for me, I still have the one my father gave me many, many years ago when I fell down those stairs.
If you have a friend who's never played this beat em up, you have to sit down with them and play through it. And at the very least, if you love the turtles, then you have to play this game. So, with that in mind, guys, I give this game my completionist rating of Complete It. Complete it. That's all the time we have for today, guys. So please, as always, let me know about today's episode somewhere on the internet. A big thank you to our Patreon folks over here who make these episodes happen each and every time that we do them. If you want to check out the live stream of me playing this game, you can click or tap that on screen right here, right now. I've been Gerard Clearly the Completionist, and we'll see you next time for another brand new episode of The Completionist New Game Plus. Bye.